In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs> We've come to the part of our sacred story that immediately follows the climax, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's also known as a low Sunday when we find the pews a little bit less full than we did last week, at least. But it's still Easter, and there's still more important parts of the story to be told. If you think back to grade school and learning the parts of a story, you might remember that every story has five parts. The exposition, rising action, the climax, falling action, and finally, the resolution. Last week, Remington reminded us about the overarching power of this narrative and how the story of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem had legs. It literally swept people up and carried them to where they never imagined they would go. Today, we get to focus on that falling action and how the supporting characters come to terms with what happened to the main character. It may not be as exciting as the climax, but without this part, we would never reach the resolution. The gospel story today focuses somewhat on Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, and how he missed out on seeing Jesus when he first appeared, and how he famously said he would not believe unless he too got to see Jesus and touch the wounds. Poor Thomas gets the nickname of Doubting Thomas, I think, unfairly. He gets left out, and we all know how awful that can feel. If we back up the story a little bit, we recall that after Mary sees the stone rolled away, she runs to tell Peter and John that Jesus' body has been taken out of the tomb, and she doesn't know to where. Peter and John race each other, to the tomb to see if it's true, and finding the tomb empty, return to their homes. I wish we knew more about what was happening here. Like, what were they thinking and feeling after Mary tells them that the body is gone? How were they making sense of what happened? Did they think that Jesus' body had been moved or stolen, or did they know that Jesus had risen from the dead? Were they reviewing in their minds everything that he had ever told them? Did they return home hoping that Jesus would meet them there? And why wasn't Thomas with them? Where was he? What we do know is that Mary is the first to see the risen Christ. She encounters Jesus in the garden and then goes to tell the disciples the good news that she has seen the risen Lord and that he would be ascending to the Father. I also wonder what might have happened had Jesus not appeared to any of them. Would they have believed that Jesus had risen if they hadn't all seen it for themselves? Would they have all doubted and demanded to see for themselves just like Thomas did? It seems to me that Jesus knew he had some work still to do with these disciples. They hadn't yet grasped God's plan and were confused and rightly traumatized by the events that had just taken place. I don't think it's fair to characterize any of them as being faithful or doubtful, as if those were different corners or columns. The letter to the Hebrews describes faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. To have faith in what is unseen almost always involves doubt on some level. Paul Tillich says that doubt isn't the opposite of faith at all. It's an element of faith. And Khalil Gibran, author of the book The Prophet, says that doubt is a pain too lonely to know that faith is its twin brother. Which brings us back to Thomas the twin. What if, instead of shaming Thomas for doubting, we commend him for his courage in naming his need, his desire to also see and touch Jesus like the other disciples had the opportunity to do, so that he too can believe? 
The truth is, is that we are all a lot like Thomas. Chances are we have wrestled with faith and doubt and have been learning to voice our needs and desires in our relationship with God ever since, sometimes privately, sometimes publicly. Think about how you came to faith. It's very rarely a flip of a switch. Usually coming to faith is a journey. It's a gradual climb with starts and stops, twists and turns. Some of us were raised in the church and basically marinated in our faith. Sometimes it's all we know. But it's also likely that something happened in your life that made the faith of your family come real to you in some way. Some of us weren't introduced to faith until adulthood, and it was our doubts and our questions that drove us to look for meaning and answers that only faith could provide. And many of us have had an experience where we were able to taste or see or experience in some tangible way that this Jesus, this sacred story about God coming near to us, about being revealed in human form, is real, even if we don't understand how. We got swept up in the story, too. The questions and the doubts and the mystery surrounding it doesn't diminish the story to the point that we lose all faith. Sometimes the questions and those doubts draw us in even more to seek greater learning, greater understanding, to help us ask for what we need. The good news for those of us who struggle with faith and doubt is that our sacred story is not just about a group of disciples who run and hide when Jesus is crucified and don't believe the woman at the tomb, or each other for that matter. This is a story about a God who goes to endless lengths to prove his love, a God who is willing to take on the sins of the world and forever be marked with the signs of the crucifixion, a God who will show up wherever we are, even when we are hiding out in fear, and invite us in to see and to touch so that we too can know. Another amazing thing about this story is that it still has legs. It's spread across the world centuries ago by a bunch of imperfect supporting characters, unaided by technology and it is still being told today. You and I are invited to be witnesses and supporting characters in this story too. The work that Jesus came to do continues in this day and age because the story has not reached its resolution yet. We're not at the end. Until Jesus comes back or the world is transformed into the kingdom God designed, we get to make God's love and presence real and visible to those in our day-to-day -day lives. We get to seek out those hiding in fear and share the peace of God with them and tell them the good news that the lengths of God that God will go to to be in relationship with us. By God's good design, the story still continues to be told through Jesus' disciples. Imperfect people like you and me, full of faith and doubts, wants and needs, living and sharing the good news of God's incredible love. Alleluia, Christ is risen.